We're dealing in theology with the nature of the second advent. Last time we said that Christ will come in person, visibly, literally, which is the answer to all of the erroneous views that he's going to come spiritually in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, come at death or something of that nature. But he'll come literally, visibly, in person, in power and glory with his holy angels, with his saints. He'll come quickly, he'll come unexpectedly. A lot of people are going to be surprised. That brings us to the terminology used. I don't think I gave you this. The rapture is referred to by various terms. It's called in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17, a catching away. Actually, what most people think of as a rapture is a catching away to meet the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 16 and 17. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. In other words, he received this directly from the Lord. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not go before them that are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Now this verb or phrase be caught up is what we mean by rapture. But actually that's what the Greek means to be caught away. Again rapture is an English term not Greek. So it means to be caught away. It's described as a gathering in chapter 2 and verse 1. A gathering together with Christ. But it still speaks of what we call rapture in 2 Thessalonians 2.1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. So there it's a gathering together. The term rapture, of course, doesn't occur in the Greek. I guess we didn't say that, but that's what we're implying by these statements. It's described by various terms. A gathering together with Christ, a catching away to meet him. And then in 1 Thessalonians 3.13, the rapture is implied, though it isn't mentioned directly, it's implied that it's already taken place. 1 Thessalonians 3.13. To the end that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with his saints. Well, as we've said before, the only way we can come with him, we had to get where he was. In 1 Thessalonians 4, he goes on to tell you how that'll happen. In verse 17, we'll be caught up, or raptured, to meet him in the air. Now, the rapture, as we've said before, too, doesn't mean you're raptured up into the third heaven. But that you're raptured in 1 Thessalonians 4, overcomers at least. Well, let's save that for later about overcomers. But we are raptured to meet him in the air. It says in the clouds and it will be evermore with him. And then in verse 13 of chapter 3, he's already said that he's going to bring his saints back with him. Now, I recognize, too, that some people say saints here, which the term means holy ones. They say that's his angels. But in other passages, he always says angels. When he's going to bring his angels back, he says on more than one occasion, his holy angels will come with him. And so the term here means saints in all the other passages. So why should we not think that in view of all the other teaching about being caught away and coming back and the end time revelation that he's giving to by vision and revelation and prophecy that overcomers will be caught away, changed and brought back to minister to this world, especially the dead institutional church during tribulation. Since the dead church will go through it. We speak of denominationalism and dead in the same context. <laughs> but <laughs> not trying to be funny, but if you don't know what we mean by dead church, we mean denominational church. Institutional church is a term that, that I've 
well, I won't say I coined, but I guess I'm about the only one that uses it, or used to be the only one. There's a word of caution here now about rapture. Now, let me say before we say this, that there are tapes on end time events that deal with the aspects of the rapture. And as I said last time, we're not going to get into what's on the tapes. We're simply dealing with rapture as a part of eschatology in biblical theology, end time events. But with that in mind, there's a word of caution to keep in mind, and the tapes will show you this, that in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul is only dealing with the general fact of the rapture. Now, some people never become good interpreters of the word, that is, expositors of the word, because they can't distinguish between a general fact and what the rest of the word has to say about the details of that fact. Like the institutional church, again, believes in a general resurrection. If you'll get into the word, you'll find there's more than one resurrection clearly taught. And so they'll take a passage that deals with the fact of the resurrection and say, see, this is all there is. The wicked and dead are raised at the same time and so on. So you have to keep in mind, if you're going to understand end time events, eschatology, end time eschatology, that in many passages in scripture, New Testament as well as Old, there are general statements made that you have to take the rest of Revelation to fill in the details of it. You see, in 1 Thessalonians 4, it's like painting a picture. I don't know if you've ever done it. I used to do it. I've got some in the process that never got finished. I got the Holy Ghost. I had a workshop in my basement and uh, had some things I was building that never got finished. I was remodeling a house. I had it all done but the bedroom and bathroom, and it never got finished. The fact is that unless we understand that in many places in Scripture, it's like when you paint a picture, an oil painting or whatever, you paint in the background first, then you fill in the details and all the pretty colors. And it looks like a mess when you first start. And some of those that I had just painted in the background, you'd see what I'm talking about. That all it is, the general scene. You could get an idea, well, that's going to be a mountain scene with a lake down there. Well, it wouldn't take a lot of brains to figure that out because that's the background. That's the first layer. But what gets added is something else, the details. And so in 1 Thessalonians 4, he's dealing with the fact of the rapture just like he deals with the fact of the resurrection in a general fashion. You see, look at verse 16. And all he's dealing here is with the fact of the resurrection. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel, trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now that's all he said. And we already know that there are several resurrections. If you've ever read the New Testament once, just once, you know Revelation 20 speaks of two resurrections. And blessed is he that has part in the first resurrection. Amen. And the rest live not again until the thousand years were finished. So you don't have to be too bright to figure out if there's a first resurrection and then the rest of the dead didn't live until after the thousand year period was over. Just by the fact you said first and that other statement must mean there are at least two aspects to the general truth of the resurrection. And so that's what we've got with respect to rapture. There's various aspects to the rapture. We're not going to give you a chronology any more than I can give you a chronology of the resurrection. When are the Old Testament saints raised? I believe at the end of tribulation. And some people have charts on this where they're very dogmatic. If you don't believe that fact, you just may not get too much fellowship that the Old Testament saints are resurrected at a certain place and a certain time according to their scheme, and that there are four groups at the marriage supper. They're the friends of the bridegroom, and there's the bride, and servants, and so on and so forth. And I don't get all of that out of Revelation. They end up making Israel the friends of the bridegroom, and my Bible says, all through Old and New Testament, that Israel is God's wife, his first beloved. That's why he's going to restore her. And the church only exists because his wife was unfaithful, became a spiritual adulteress. That's humbling, but that's also Romans 11. That the only reason that we're meeting here tonight, 
saved and have our sins forgiven and can talk in tongues is because Israel, as a wife, was unfaithful. But over 141 times, God says he will restore her. Amen. And in no less passage than Acts 1 and Romans 11, that's taught. That isn't just Old Testament theology. So I don't know when the aspects of the resurrection or the rapture, and I don't think anyone else does. I think we ought to be careful of putting too much stock in chronologies. So I'm not going to give you a chronology. I want to suggest, though, the aspects of the rapture. Because he's only speaking here of the general fact of the rapture, that there will be a rapture. And if that's all you've got, 1 Thessalonians 4, then everybody gets raptured at once. It's saved. You see. But there are other passages in Scripture. So this is not a chronology, but the aspects of the rapture as I see it. I believe it will take place this way, that there will be a first fruits rapture, first of all. And that's the man-child of Revelation 12. Now, people who need proof texts for everything will have to do like I always require. Come and sit for two or three years under the teaching. Open your heart. And the Spirit of God will show you that there's going to be a first fruits rapture. I believe he will show you that. First of all, you'd have to understand what Revelation 12 is talking about. So get our book, Deeper Life in the Spirit, where we deal with that at sufficient length, and it's on tapes. I don't think you can argue the fact that the man-child is a group, and that's all dealt with, as I say. And most certainly can't be Christ, and we plainly show you why not. The man-child is the first fruits, the overcomers. Then the Great Tribulation. Keep in mind, not specifically a chronology, but you can't help from getting a chronology when you start saying this is the way you believe it will happen. Tribulation, the Great Tribulation. And we've got a whole series on the book of Revelation to show that we believe that. And then there is a rapture of the woman in Revelation 12, verse 6 and verse 14. We might want to just quickly look at that so we can see... The if you don't remember that fact, we've taught on this before. It's in the book, Deeper Life in the Spirit. But you might notice again, quickly here, this fact without, as I say, going into detail on it since it's already dealt with. Revelation 12:4, speaking of Satan, he was ready to be delivered, the man-child, and he was ready to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with the rod of iron, and her child was caught up into God into his throne. Now, in verse 6, and the woman, now I see the man child's gone. We already show you on the tapes in the book, Deeper Life, that the man child can't be Jesus, and there are very good reasons why it can't be. It's utterly impossible. And we can't, as I say, teach that 15 times. We've already got it dealt with. But notice someone's still left down here. Now, whatever you believe about the church going through tribulation or not, the institutional church, somebody's down here getting persecuted. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her for three and a half years. That's 2,203 score days. That period is mentioned about seven times in Scripture. That's half of the tribulation period of seven years. Then down in verse 14, And to the woman were given, now here's her rapture. And to the woman was given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and a half a time. There's that three and a half period again. It's called 42 months in Revelation 11, time, times, half time, uh, 1,200, three score days. It occurs under several figures this way. In Daniel, it's the 70th week, you see. He speaks of the midst of the week, again, the three and a half period. Now, you see, right away, because of institutional church teaching, everybody thinks of raptures being caught up to the third heaven, to paradise, instead of what First Thessalonians says. It's interesting, the Bible doesn't say what the songs in the church say. And we've already been through that a hundred times, that it doesn't say we're going to heaven anyway, but there will be created a new heavens and earth wherein dwells righteousness. And Revelation 21, New Jerusalem, our city, comes down out of heaven to reside as the headquarters Messiah and his people after millennium. New heavens and new earth, and I saw new Jerusalem coming down. So the woman, it said, caught away. You see, raptured, but 
Catching away doesn't mean to third heaven or anywhere. It doesn't even have to mean to the clouds in this case, but she's caught away somewhere where God will protect her during the worst part of tribulation. So whatever one believes or doesn't believe or knows or doesn't know, you've got to deal with Revelation 12 to move on with God in this end time. That is, you have to come to grips with it. There's a man-child raptured. There's a woman in the midst of tribulation, the middle of it, in fact, that's raptured or caught away. And keep in mind that catching away doesn't have to mean always the same thing because the term rapture doesn't occur. Sometimes it's a gathering together. Sometimes it's caught away for protection. Sometimes it's caught up and so on. Various aspects to the rapture. So... You'll do yourself a favor if you do keep in mind that First Thessalonians, and people stumble over this because of denominational teaching about general resurrection, general judgment, general rapture. If you'll keep in mind, First Thessalonians deals with the fact of the rapture, the fact of the resurrection. Other passages have to be taken together with that, like on any doctrine for that matter to get the whole picture because right in that passage he deals with resurrection but he doesn't say there are two aspects to it God may show some of you there are five raptures five aspects to it one brother says he's shown me that apostle, prophet and I accept that he's both of those I have reasons for saying that in fact he's the one that prayed for me for seven weeks without food or water that I'd get the Holy Ghost he saw me in vision over in Denmark and then he told me personally, he said, God has shown me that there are five catching away. I believe he said all of them are in Revelation 12. Well, I won't insist on that. That's a man's word. But somewhere along the line, you have to find a true prophet and apostle that you can take his word. Teacher and evangelist and pastor and fellow Christian. If God shows you things, that blesses me. I don't throw it out unless it's out of harmony with the word. He says... Five aspects to the one rapture. So keep that in mind, that Revelation 20 speaks of at least two resurrections, and there are more than that, no doubt. Because when's Israel raised? See, there's a resurrection. I didn't mean the dead saints, like Abraham and so forth, because they'll certainly be in the millennium. Well, that's just to whet your appetite and keep in mind that rapture or resurrection or judgment does not mean that because they've used the word that that's all there is to it. That it's just a general thing. It all happens together in the flesh or an eye. It'd be interesting for you to listen to some of the tapes, for example, and read the Deeper Life book on this because there's a period in Daniel of 1,335 days that no one knows what it means. There's a gap, and it's specifically mentioned that blessed is he that waits until these days are fulfilled. And that's after the return of Christ, before the millennium starts. And so what most premillennialists believe is that's the time of the judgments, not the great white throne judgment, which comes after millennium, but judgment of the saints for their works and the separation of the sheep and goats nations. Because many nations, we're told, go into the millennium, but most do not. That is, people out of the nations. And so there's a period of time when the earth has to be restored for millennium. Now, it isn't the new heavens and new earth because the Bible speaks of a geographical change in Palestine especially. Because the city in Ezekiel and the temple can't even fit over there at the present geographical situation. It wouldn't fit. And, of course, you know what denominational people do. They rule it out and say, see, it's to be spiritualized. It won't even fit over there. Then why did Ezekiel spend, why did God, through Ezekiel, spend eight chapters giving specific details and measurements of the millennial temple and the city? I mean, what do all those details mean? It just goes on verse after verse, page after page after page. And if they knew the word of God, they'd see in Zechariah and other passages, God speaks of a leveling taking place and a change, a geographical, a topographical change of the physical aspects of this earth. It'll be a time when everywhere will be like a garden of Eden, the whole world, and so on. But that's just the thousand year period. And then the new heavens and new earth, Revelation 21, 22, comes after that. Well, praise God for people who can believe the word without struggling, and I do. 
Amen. I know one thing. I don't know where some of those are going to be who spiritualize the millennium and Jesus' literal reign on earth and so forth and so on, but I don't know where they'll be during millennium, but I know where I'll be. <laughs> because the Bible says that I'll be reigning and ruling with him if I'm an overcomer, and that's my confession. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, still speaking of Second Advent, some misconceptions concerning the perfection of the church. Misconceptions concerning the perfection of the church. Does it occur before or at the rapture? When will we be perfected? Now the institutional church, perhaps I shouldn't say institutional, maybe most Christians answer this by saying God is now in the process of sanctifying his church. And the process of sanctification will be completed at second advent and that will be our perfection. Most Christians hold to that view taught by the denominations that God is now in the process of sanctifying his church. That process will be completed at the appearance of Christ, which will be when we are perfected, that we'll never be perfected in this life, or we can't be perfect. They use, among other passages, 1 John 3, 1 and 2. It's a very important question because when Christ comes for his church, he doesn't want to be ashamed of it. And the Bible has something to say about our perfection and our sanctification. 1 John 3, 1 and 2. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. Well, I told you verses 1 to 2, that's where they stop. Are we coming through? Because the next verse <laughs> says, If we are going to see him as he is and be made like him as he is when he appears, that we would be like him then we will purify ourselves now as he is pure. He's perfectly pure. The institutional church on this doctrine confuses sanctification with perfection. First of all, they confuse sanctification with perfection. Now, it's a little bit repetitious to say we've got it on tape. We're not trying to oversimplify everything, but after all, you can't keep teaching same thing every night, or you'd never get through. So there is a tape on Christian perfection. Again, in the Deeper Life book, there are several pages on what a Christian is to do to be perfect, or what is required to be perfect. This view confuses sanctification with perfection. Remember it said that God is now in the process of sanctifying the Christian, and that will be completed at the second advent on the basis of 1 John 3, 1 and 2. When we see him, we'll be like him. That means all of a sudden we'll be changed physically and spiritually and everything else. But that erroneous view stems from the fact that people who teach it don't have the baptism. So they don't know what perfection is. There's no way in the world they could achieve even what they call sanctification, let alone perfection. Some of us know from experience, I know myself for 14 years, I tried to perform, produce in my life what the Holy Spirit produces through my life as I yield to him now that I have the baptism. Where before it was an effort, now it's a privilege to watch him work in and through your life. 
it confuses sanctification, first of all, with perfection. We're being progressively sanctified. The Bible doesn't teach that. Hear our tape on it. Read the Deeper Life book. We'll give you just one passage tonight, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, to show you you're not going to be sanctified. If you have to be, you won't be. That all the sanctification you're going to get, you've already got. As the tape and the book will show you, the term to sanctify doesn't mean to make holy. It means to separate yourself to God, consecrate yourself to Him. And you're already separated to God when you're saved. You are consecrated to Him. Now, of course, you have to act out what is true. If you don't, then it probably isn't true, of course. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11. Know ye not that unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Well, it'd be good to read this just from what it says. Be not deceived. I want the church to hear what he says. Okay, that's why I'm taking a little time. Know you not that unrighteous people will not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Who won't get in? Fornicators? Young people, are you listening? You're deceived, he said. If you're fornicating, and it isn't anything new to this church or any church I've ever known about that there aren't some fornicators that appear pious on Sunday and then need counseling or help with the authorities because somebody got pregnant or whatever on Wednesday. Or maybe Tuesday. They were probably here on Wednesday. I'm not trying to be funny. Fornicators won't get in. Nor idolaters. Nor adulterers. Nor effeminate. That's speaking of a man who has an effeminate spirit and nature. And all of the things that go with that. Sodomy and so forth. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Nor thieves. Nor covetous. People are always looking for that dollar. Nor drunkards nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Now verse 11 is our sanctification. But such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. You're not going to get sanctified unless you're going to get justified, unless you're going to get washed. You can't have it three ways or even two. You are washed, you are justified, you are sanctified. And, of course, I don't know of a seminary that doesn't teach progressive sanctification. Past sanctification, present sanctification, future sanctification. Past sanctification by the blood of Jesus, present sanctification by the word. As you hear the word, you're more and more sanctified and obey it. Future sanctification, 1 John 3, 2, that when we see him, we'll be like him. We'll be perfected. Well, the only trouble with that, there's no scripture for it. Every passage, as we show on the tape where we deal with this, and in the book, Deeper Life, we show you every passage that speaks of sanctification says it's already done. It's not a process. Now, they confuse sanctification with perfection, which is a growth and a process. Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 15, tells us that apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers have been set in the church to bring the church to perfection, to bring it to maturity till it grows up to be of the measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. Now, a familiar passage to us here, of course, but doesn't hurt to remind you again that he says that they've been set in the church for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith to the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a mature man, a perfect man. Now, if we're going to be perfected out there somewhere, you're already perfected, friends. You're already sanctified. You have to start walking out your consecration, your separation, and your perfection. But perfection here, the word means to be matured in spiritual things. So for the maturing of the saints to spiritual maturity, which is the same thing as perfection, of course, as long as you're not spiritually mature, you're not perfected. Till we all come to the unity of the faith unto a perfect man, see, a mature or perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And verse 15, as we speak the truth in love, we will grow up in him in all things, who is the head, even Christ. 
See, it isn't that you're supposed to get more and more sanctified or more and more perfect. We recognize that we're not like Jesus who had no sin and no tainted human nature while he was full man and his humanity was real in that he had to learn and be taught things. The Bible says that. Hebrews 5, 8, for example. He had to be subject to his parents, Luke 2, and learn from them. Yet, at the same time, there wasn't anything he had to unlearn. There wasn't something that he would do wrong until he got revelation. That isn't what we're saying. But with us, it's a little differently. We've got to unlearn a lot of what even parents have taught. And I mean that in the right sense because we teach obedience to parents here. What you learned in school and parents and in church. Oh, yes, in church. <laughs> Things I learned in church. When I first got saved in St. Pete, I went to church the next Sunday and being Baptist, that would mean Sunday school first. And the first Sunday was the lesson on 2 Corinthians 12 and Paul's thorn. Well, and the teacher laid out how this was ophthalmia, a disease of the eyes. He really, for an hour, laid out a case there that you couldn't answer. You know, I didn't know anything about the Word, but I had read the Bible enough to know of what he spoke. And I thought, oh, praise God for such a depth and insight into the Word that I'll be glad when God enables me to be able to teach like that. You know, making Paul sick over there, and he doesn't say he's sick at all. Again, we got a tape on that. Paul's thorn, Job's boils, <laughs> Epaphroditus' sickness. We got a tape on everything, friends, but what we're teaching. About. <laughs> so see what I had done learn. I thought, my, where did he get all of that? Because I couldn't get it out of the text, and I thought it must be there all through Genesis to Revelation. And it'll take time. I was really blessed to find that God could heal, but generally didn't, and that's why I was born sick and had a lot of problems all my life until I got the Holy Ghost. We are perfected. We are sanctified. We're perfected by the blood of Jesus. But as we hear the word, we're not getting progressively sanctified, but we are maturing spiritually, growing up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, growing up into a perfect man that is a spiritually mature man. That's all dealt with on the tape, Christian Perfection. But anyway, they confuse sanctification with perfection, which is a growth, biblical perfection. That we are sanctified, another passage you might mention in passing, which they use, but I don't see how they can use it. They're certainly not reading the passage. They use this to prove that we won't be perfected till Jesus comes, but 1 Thessalonians 5.23 shows me we're already ready for Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. That is, set you apart fully. Consecrate you fully. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the completion of sanctification, they use this verse to show, comes at the appearance of Christ. But, again, it's a general statement. All the other passages which speak of sanctification speak of the fact we are sanctified. And I believe that's what he's saying there, that we are to be preserved. His prayer is we will be preserved in this holiness and sanctification and perfection until Jesus comes. Now, what's the purpose of sanctification and perfection? Ephesians 5, 26 and 27, which is really what we're talking about. Why does he want us perfected? Ephesians 5, 26 and 27 tells you. It's with respect to his return. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, gave himself for it, that he might sanctify it, that is, separate it, set it apart, and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. Now, he said before he left he could return an instant after he left. You know, all the teaching is you turn right away. So it must be 
that the church is perfected by him already. But as long as we remain in the world, it's a process of walking out of perfection and growing. We're not supposed to be taking 10 years to decide whether or not the baptism of the Holy Spirit is true or divine healings in the word or whether we're to take up a cross and follow him or not. I mean, literally follow him in the crucified life or to put off cigarette habit or lust or TV-itis or whatever it is that has you bound, if it has you bound. You should be perfected already in that sense when you're a new creature in Christ. Behold, if any man's in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things, including whatever you say, I just can't get the victory over or whatever. And some people say that, don't they? Old things are passed away and all things are become new. So while there is a process of growth into that spiritual maturity, the Bible says, be you perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He didn't say take 20 years to be perfect. That's right. He means right now start living the Sermon on the Mount. Amen. That's how you'll be perfect. That's where he said it, Matthew 5, 48. When God said in 1 Peter 1, 16, be ye holy as I am holy, he doesn't mean take a lifetime and wait till Jesus comes, then you'll be perfected and you'll be holy. He means right now. So there's a sense, as I say, in which sanctification's already done, of course. It says we are sanctified, but there's a sense in which when we see Jesus, everything that we're struggling now to accomplish, struggling against sin and temptation, will all pass away and the perfection will be realized there in a way that we don't know it yet. Yet perfection is already an experience for those who are saved and have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I add the baptism because you need that to bear the fruit of the Spirit since it's the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of Hobart Freeman. Fourteen years, fruit of Hobart Freeman wasn't too pleasant to look at. I tried, but I wasn't satisfied. Are you? Praise God. Well, you can be satisfied when you have the Holy Spirit because the Spirit of God is present to producing you what you can't do by your own efforts. <laughs>